of cell phone use. We'll hear from researchers who say that cell phone use may increase the risk of brain cancer and of tumors that damage hearing nerves. This runs two hours, five minutes. Committee will come to order. Uh, before we begin, I just uh, want to thank all of you for being here, but share with you that we're at a uh, time in our nation's history where there are events that have developed of great import with respect to the economy. And uh, I felt it was necessary to go forward with this hearing, particularly because so many people made efforts to be here and because of the importance of the subject. There will be members of Congress who will be coming in and out uh, during the course of this hearing, I'm hopeful. Uh, and the ranking member, Mr. Issa, who is also very involved in uh, some of the economic issues that we're talking about, has communicated to me that he asked uh, me to start the hearing uh, without him. Usually we start uh, with he and I beginning together. Uh, but uh, with Mr. Issa's uh, permission, uh, I'm going to uh, begin so that we can uh, move quickly to get the testimony on the record of the people who are here today. So uh, this is the uh, Committee on Oversight and Government Reform Subcommittee on Domestic Policy. I'm Congressman Dennis Kucinich, the chairman of the subcommittee. Today's hearing will examine what science is saying about the potential links between long-term use of cell phones and tumors or other health effects. Uh, without objection, uh, the chair and the ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who appears and seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. Cell phones have evolved from a clunky novelty to a sleek utility. They have become indispensable and, for many, inseparable from modern life. They're everywhere, in America, Europe, and some parts of Asia. While consumer demand for cell phones has grown, and as the technology has evolved to give consumers more option uh, and faster connectivity, a vigorous debate has been taking place among scientists about whether long-term use of cell phones causes tumors in the people who use them. Recently, that debate caught the public's attention with the publication in July of a warning from a preeminent oncologist about the human health effects of cell phone use. We are fortunate to have the author of that memorandum as well as a distinguished group of individuals as witnesses before this committee today. I regret that the CTIA, the Association of the Wireless Telecommunications Industry, declined our invitation to testify. Uh, by their refusal, unfortunately, uh, they deny this Congress and the public the benefit of their testimony and the opportunity to pose questions and to hear answers. I hope that the wireless industry will reconsider their decision. Uh, should the uh, subcommittee determine it would be beneficial to hold further hearings on this matter. However, I'm grateful to the minority of the subcommittee for identifying another highly qualified expert from the National Cancer Institute. I'm confident that he will add immeasurably to the hearing. I'm proud to say that this subcommittee's partnership and spirit of cooperation with the minority is the rule rather than the exception. And I want to thank them, uh, thank Mr. Issa, for engaging in this hearing. In exploring this topic, it is my belief that the complicated scientific questions should be left to scientists. I challenge our witnesses today to answer the questions posed by members of the subcommittee clearly and to challenge each other as well. In typical public debates over potential links between an environmental exposure and a health problem, 
convention is that the message must be black and white. On one side, the charge is made, explicit or implicit, that there is no scientific doubt about a certain health effect from the exposure of concern. On the other side, the relevant industry defends its product with the scientific assertion that there is no evidence that exposure to X causes health effect Y. Often, the reality and the science lie somewhere in between. My hope is that we can improve the public's and, the, and Congress's understanding about the gray area in this scientific debate. Today, we will let experts present the evidence, discuss the studies, describe the limitations of what is known and what can be implied from the data that we have. The question before us, then, is whether the evidence is sufficient to merit action by regulators and legislators to protect public health. What have other national government health authorities done to protect their people based on the same scientific data? What should Congress or the administration do, if anything, uh, here in the United States? Uh, at this point, I uh, want to recognize and, and welcome uh, the distinguished ranking member of our subcommittee, Congressman Darrell Issa of California. Mr. Issa and I have uh, worked together uh, as partners uh, in this subcommittee uh, where we have our differences. Uh, we we uh, differ in, in a manner that is collegial, uh, but where we agree we have opportunities to uh, really uh, make uh, some profound differences. And I want to thank Mr. Issa for uh, uh, for his presentation and for his presence here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, as you said quite rightly, uh, we come from different parties and we have reached different conclusions on where government should go. But when it comes to the conclusion that science has to drive the decision process, we, we have no differences. This is an important uh, hearing today. It's important for a number of reasons. First of all, I understand it has been 15 years since the last time a hearing like this was held. Uh, secondly, as somebody who spent his career both in the military and then more extensively for 20 years in business producing radio frequency products, I'm acutely aware that in fact there is a link at some point along the spectrum to cancer. Now I say that not to say that today that we will hear any conclusive evidence as to cell phones. We don't have that. And I think, quite frankly, we deserve to get it. But we do know that, for example, x-rays being used to measure shoes extensively decades ago led to a higher incidence of cancer. And in fact, today we know to limit, the va although valuable, we know to limit x-rays to that which is essential. And all our medical per personnel here would say the same thing, that uh, we don't unreasonably expose ourselves to x-rays even though we avail ourselves of the benefits. UV rays. There are many people in the, in the stands today who have suntans. If they're like me, they're natural. If, in fact, they were, they were gleaned from the sun, then you know that you do it at a significant peril that has been well documented. These rays are no different than any other rays, any other bandwidth. Uh, there is a potential for damage at some level. And in many cases, as I say, we've studied it. We know a little bit about x-rays. We know about uh, ultraviolet. It's very clear that we need to know more about the rest of the spectrum at 40 hertz, 60 hertz, at 400 megahertz, at 800 megahertz, and well into the gigahertz bands. The National Cancer Institute and the World Health Organization and the American Cancer Society claim that no link has been demonstrated to date. There may be no link, but it is also very clear that if there is a link at some level in almost, at almost any radiation, that we do need to know what is safe and unsafe. As I said, I spent more than two decades in the business of producing radio frequency products. Our company meticulously adhered to the FCC standards. Those standards were primarily designed to prevent a product from interfering with other products within the spectrum. That is a good standard and appropriate. We need to find similar good standards for exposure to any bandwidth of any device. And I say, I say this not to say for a moment that I know that there's a link 
specifically anywhere close to the amount of radiation that's going out today. But I would say that the wireless industry has played no small role in the advancement and benefit to the American people. In the last 30 years, the wireless industry has changed our lives for the better in so many ways. Today, with great re re regret, we will hear from uh, Mrs. Marks about the fact that she deals with an, uh, an impossible situation of cancer that may or may not have been caused by the extensive use of a product by, uh, I'm sorry, your son, I believe. Uh, your husband, I apologize. Uh, the, uh, and we will hear that. The, uh, the, the fact is, I don't know. I do know that you're dealing with a difficult health problem and uh, certainly one that all of us have sympathy for today. We owe it to, today to, to hear what we can hear and learn what we can learn. And Mr. Chairman, I pledge to you that on a bipartisan basis in the next Congress, we will continue the work that we've been doing and take it to the next level of finding out what studies, what additional research we can uh, co-author in order to find out what we cannot necessarily answer here today. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I once lived under power lines, 20,000 volt power lines. I enjoyed the extra backyard. I felt no particular fear that uh, the high voltage lines were going to hurt me. Today I still don't. But many people, when I went to sell that house, enjoyed the extra backyard and were willing to pay for it. Many others looked and said, how could you live underneath these? Don't you know it causes cancer? The American people deserve their government to answer the questions about radiation at all level. I believe we have done it well in some areas. I think the testimony here today will show we have done it poorly in others. So Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate your indulgence, your friendship, and certainly the two years we've spent working on this committee together and yield back. I, I thank the uh, gentleman from California. Uh, I want to now introduce our panel. Uh, first, uh, to my left, Ellen Marks. Ellen Marks is a realtor and a small business owner. She is the wife of Alan Marks, who was diagnosed in May 2008 with a malignant brain tumor in his right frontal lobe. Mr. Marks could not himself be present today to testify about his personal experience with cell phones and cancer. Mrs. Marks will testify on his behalf. Julius Knapp. Julius Knapp is Chief of the uh, Federal Communication Commission's Office of Engineering and Technology. The Office of Engineering and Technology is the Commission's primary resource for engineering expertise and provides technical support to the Chairman, Commissioners, and Federal Communications Commission bureaus and officers. Mr. Knapp has responsibility within the Office of Engineering and Technology for spectrum allocations and technical rules for radio frequency devices. Previously, Mr. Knapp served as the Chief of the Policy and Rules Division where he was responsible for FCC frequency allocation proceedings and for proceedings amending the FCC rules for radio frequency devices. Mr. Knapp was Chief of the Federal Communications Commission Laboratory from 1994 to 1997, where he was responsible for the Federal Communications Commission Equipment Authorization Program. He served as Chief of Policy and Rules Division from 1997 to 2001, where he was responsible for developing the Federal Communications Commission's policies and rules for mutual recognition agreements and telecommunication certification bodies. Next, uh, Mr. or Dr. David O. Carpenter. Dr. Carpenter is the director of the Institute for Health and Environment at the University at Albany, as well as professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences. A public health physician, Dr. Carpenter previously served as the director of the Wadsworth Center for Laboratories and Research of the New York State Department of Health and later as dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Albany. He has over 300 peer-reviewed publications in neuroscience, toxicology, and environmental health. He has served as the co-editor of the Bio Initiative Report 
a multi-author report on animal and human effects of exposure to power line frequency and radio frequency, uh, EMFs. And Dr. Carpenter uh, earned his MS at Harvard Medical School. Next, Dr. Ronald Herberman. Dr. Herberman is the founding director of the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute, a national cancer institute designed comprehensive cancer center specializing in innovative approaches to cancer diagnosis and treatment. Along with directing UPCI, he was director of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center uh, Cancer Centers. He also serves as chief for the Division of Hematology, Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, as well as Associate Vice Chancellor for Cancer Research at the University of Pittsburgh. Previously, Dr. Herberman was an official at the National Cancer Institute, including senior investigator in the immunology branch, section head in the laboratory of cell biology, and chief of the new laboratory of immuno immunodiagnosis. Dr. Herberman received his MD from New York University School of Medicine. He has served as president of the American Association of Cancer Institutes and serves on the editorial boards of numerous scientific journals. And finally, Dr. Robert Hoover. Dr. Hoover is director of epidemiology and biostatistics program of the Division of Cancer Epidemiology Genetics at the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Hoover earned his MD from Loyola University in Chicago and his MS and uh, SCD in epidemiology from Harvard uh, School of Public Health. Dr. Hoover serves on the editorial boards of three journals and serves on many national and international committees concerned with various aspects, ex, uh, aspects of epidemiology and preventive medicine. He has been awarded the Public Health Service Commendation Medal in 1976, the Meritorious Service Medal in 1984, and the Distinguished Service Medal in 1990. I want to thank our distinguished panelists for appearing before this subcommittee today. It is the policy of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that uh, you would all rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have each answered in the affirmative. I would ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of your testimony and to keep that summary under five minutes in duration. I want each of you to know that uh, while your testimony uh, is, is in some cases quite extensive, uh, that you don't have to give it all at this moment but that your entire testimony will be included in the record of this hearing so that members will have the opportunity to be able to uh, digest it. So uh, with that, what I would like to do is to start with Mrs. Marks and uh, again, our gratitude for your presence here today. You may proceed. Thank you for inviting me to testify at this critical hearing. My name is Ellen Marks and I live in Lafayette, California. I am here today because my beloved husband and friend of more than four decades cannot be. My husband, Alan, has a malignant brain tumor, and sadly we suspect that it is related to his long-term cell phone exposure. As difficult as this is for my family, I'm compelled to share our very personal story to impress upon you the dire need to legislate essential changes concerning cell phone health risks. Alan and I met when we were 15. He is a self-made man. He sold flowers in front of a cemetery at the age of 13 and then paid his own way through college and medical school. Alan became involved in the real estate industry and we moved from our native Chicago to Northern California in 1984. We are the proud parents of three adult children ages 26, 24, and 22. I wish we could say that we lived happily ever after, but that is not the case. The night of May 5, 2008, we were excitingly packing to leave for our daughter's college graduation the next day. 
At 2 a.m. I awoke to Alan's bizarre noises and thrashing. I couldn't wake him, and the nightmare remains to this day. The worst of his seizure lasted about 25 minutes. When his eyes opened, he could not speak or understand anything asked of him by the paramedics. Witnessing a grand mal seizure is something you can never erase from your mind. Arms flail, saliva drools, eyes roll back in the head, and the face contorts. At 4 a.m. in a cold, stark emergency room, I was told that my lifelong love has a mass in his right frontal lobe, the part of the brain that allows us to differentiate between good and bad, right and wrong, control our impulses, and relate to those you love. Imagine the pain of telling our sons who had raced to the hospital in the middle of the night that their dad's increasingly irrational behavior was not a personality problem but a lethal brain tumor. In the morning, I had no choice but to call our daughter and tell her not to pick us up at the Denver airport. Imagine her despair as she stood alone learning that her daddy could soon die. It's heartbreaking to think that he may not have that chance to walk his princess down the aisle or meet his grandchildren. Six excruciatingly long weeks later, Dr. Berger at UCSF performed a six-hour craniotomy and resection of Alan's oligodendroglioma, leaving him able to walk and talk, but personality changes remain. Titanium now holds his skull in place and the tumor will grow back. It was a slow-growing tumor which caused unexplainable, unexplainable chaos in our family for years. When you love someone and he becomes another person to act strangely, acting out against those they hold dear, you try with all your heart to find ways to help. Alan also tried with all his heart to continue to be a loving father and husband. He willingly sought professional help and took antidepressants and bipolar medications for years to no avail. He too knew something was wrong, but just not how terribly wrong. Now, as a family, we are struggling to understand that the now explainable personality changes are actually an involuntary consequence of his tumor and surgery. Not an easy task. Alan has always been a brilliant man with an incredible sense of humor and sense of responsibility to his family. He clings to that sense of resp responsibility now and is deeply depressed by his limitations. To me, he is still the most handsome man in the world, but the twinkle in his eye is gone. His cell phone and the resulting tumor have robbed us of financial security and the very pursuit of happiness. Alan, a husband, a father, and a son, has been handed a death sentence at the age of 56. Alan had his seizure and diagnosis 10 days before Senator Kennedy. Ironically, my son Zach, who is sitting behind me, interned for Senator Kennedy just a few years ago. Upon hearing a report that the senator's glioma may also be linked to cell phone use, our research began. Alan's cell phone was a vital part of his work, always on, always ringing, always right next to his head. I often threatened to throw it in the garbage and how I wish I had. He had a cell phone or the original car phone for over 20 years and he averaged over 30 hours monthly. The tumor is on the same side of his head to which he held the phone. I learned there are significant flaws in many cell phone risk studies. I learned that in Scandinavia, where cell phones have been used longer than here, a 240% increased risk of glioma has been proven who those in those who use their cell phones more than 22 hours a month. That is less than one hour daily. I learned that cell phone use is exceptionally dangerous for children. And I also learned that we are nearing an epidemic of 20 to 30 year olds who use only cell phones. If this happens, we could lose more young people to this than any war in Iran or Afghanistan. I am grateful that Dr. Herberman, a distinguished cancer scientist, has made such a courageous decision. How can we wait if, we, if waiting means sick or dead people when we have strong evidence or any evidence at all that there is a risk? What happened to my husband could happen to you or worse, to your children or grandchildren. I am sick and tired of hearing there is not enough conclusive evidence. My husband is conclusive evidence. 
I am angry as this horror could have been avoided with a simple warning. I pray that my husband's legacy will be that we help divulge the truth and that you, the leaders of our great nation, took action. Governments in other countries have taken steps to protect their citizens from this travesty. I trust you will not fail us. I beg of you not to let te technological advances invented to enrich our lives rob us of our lives instead. Please demand independent studies instead of self-serving studies funded by the cell phone industry. Please demand more rigorous safety standards. Please demand that warnings about cell phone usage and the radiation they emit be stated on every cell phone. By doing so, you will protect our most valued resource of all, human life. I love my husband with all my heart and hate what has happened to him as a result of this cancer. Please help save others from facing the deadly diagnosis and lifestyle which our family must endure, if not now, when, and if not for me, for the millions of potential victims. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Marks, for your testimony. Before I go to our next witness, I want to note that uh, we have uh, two more members of Congress who have joined us, uh, Congresswoman Diane Watson from California and Congressman uh, Higgins from New York. So I want to thank uh, the members for being here, and we certainly look forward to your participation in the uh, question and answer period. May I have just one minute? Uh, you're certainly uh, entitled to do that. That's, I haven't done this before, uh, interrupting yeah, the testimony. I, I just going. want to let the witnesses know I've experienced, Mrs. Marks, what you have. I had a niece that had two brain tumors. She grew up with a telephone on this side and one on this side. And so I just want uh, uh, all the witnesses to know that I've gone through that experience. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I thank the gentlelady. Uh, 